Canadian ska band Bedouin Soundclash's mid 2000s song, When the Night Feels My Song, was a huge hit in Canada. The song got to the point where you could hear it while grocery shopping, and it was used as bumpers on kid shows. In the US, the song was not well known, and while the group did tour down in the States frequently, they're not a household name in the US ska scene. That might be why many US ska fans are unaware that the group's latest album, We Will Meet in a Hurricane, was one of the best ska records of 2022, hands down. The group are currently on tour in the States, opening for the Interrupters. Be sure and check them out and grab their new record. Usually with ska bands, you don't really get something that sounds like it belongs in a stadium. Mm -hmm. But with Beto and Soundclash, you do. I mean, I could see this, this band playing stadiums with these songs. They're like triumphant, have like elements of gospel. It's... It's great stuff. It's different, it, it, unique influences. Yeah. If you haven't checked them out, if you've heard the name a lot of times, like I had, just take a second, maybe even before you dip into the episode, just listen to a couple songs off the new album, and then we'll get into it. I want to talk about your new record, We Will Meet in a Hurricane. The vibe, I get kind of a vibe from the record that almost sounds like uh, gospel music to me a little bit. I was curious if that was a component that you intentionally put in, or if it's just the way I'm hearing it. Yeah, no, I mean, there are gospel elements, are there? I'm, I'm trying I'm going, going through all of the songs. Cause I like, we, what we only in a hurricane has a, is like a, almost like a church, like at him, like, you know, like Anglican yeah. him. <laughs> uh, and, but then, um, uh, longer days and shorter years definitely has that more, gospel feel to it i love i love the human voice that's my like I, I any i think a lot with with the bedouin records that we're probably best known for it always had a three-part harmony you know whether it was like when the night feels my song and street gospels um to me I, I don't know if it was that when i was growing up i we had to sing hymns and i love i love harmony and hearing people sing in that setting i think it's always compelling yeah, I think it's like literally like certain like walk through fire chorus has like a more of like a literal to me gospel sound. But I think even overall, like vibe wise, the sort of bittersweet, like sort of celebratory, but, you know, that there's a recognition of a darkness sort of component to the record also sort of gives me like gospel in in the kind of the greater scheme, like a more of a, you know, oh, I kind of like the where you guys are coming from almost. Yeah, no, I think that's really cool. I think, um, I think a lot of the time, a lot of the music that I think Jay and I both, you know, really gravitate towards, but also try to not even try to make. I think just naturally kind of gravitates towards making um, has a real spiritual element to it. Anyway, um, I think we're both really like interested in you know the human spirit and how um, kind of kind of like the, the just the everyday things that people in, in the human spirit has to face. And I think Jay often has written from that kind of place. And, you know, when you say that you hear a lot of gospel kind of elements and things like that, I get it too with, yeah, some of the choral elements, but also the, like just some of the organ sounds harking back to it. And I think about sounds like beyond four walls and things like that, where, yeah, there's just a bunch of voices. And I think um, when you get a bunch of voices together, um, you got a really strong sense of spirit as well. Who are those uh, chorus vocals in there? Like the like the big kind of choral sounding vocals. Who is that? Yeah, that's a good question because we had to. <laughs> we it was the it was you know we made this record during the pandemic so that we didn't have access to a large choir. Um, <laughs> right. Even if we did, you know, no one was like it's like it was the last thing that we were going to be allowed to do was uh, sing uh, and be sharing air with a large group of people. Right. So we had to do it all kind of like piecemeal. Like we're like, oh, we know these two girls. Like this. So on the record, there's Lo and Laura from a band named Carmana, and they sing, uh, and they they kind of have like the really strong, um, f- like female. I kind of I put them between gospel and co- like you know like country gospel, and then there's like gospel like New Orleans gospel. Mm-hmm. There's a different sound. Like there's a different way of hitting it, and different way you. Um, like accent to it, um, like where the emphasis is put in the in the phrasing and stuff. 
And um, and that was sort of like where we like with some of the songs because like I I with where I really feel like Lo and Laura really shine like uh into the black the last song on the record is i think a good example of that because it is we have slide we have uh this guy scott shields playing um, or sorry scott shields scott smith playing um slide guitar and it, it is really a country so it's like some, somewhat of a country song um and they're singing on it and i think um so we had them th- sorry i'm going off on a tangent here no it's great but uh you know they uh they filled that element then we then we were like oh we need some like meat to like the you know some force to it and we needed to find singers that just belted um and that's sort of, sort of hard to find so where like where we were so we asked the guys in this other band current swell to come in this was all done in in victoria on on vancouver island like off the coast of of uh like vancouver in between vancouver and bellingham basically um and so the guys in Currents while they're like in a kind of folk rock band, they sang like the mid, the alto parts. Uh, and they were very, they really shone on songs where we were trying to do that, like a more of a spaghetti, like Western vibe, like more <laughs> Kone vibe on um, man from cascades. Uh, and, um, and, and uh, beyond four walls. Yeah. So we just, we, we had to create, we, we basically had to create a choir, but it had to all be done uh, separately and it, they weren't actually in a choir together um and uh very pandemic you know it was a very <laughs> pandemic project that we were doing so anyway no, none of those vocals are are a keyboard pad right no <laughs> <laughs> they just sound so perfect like uh, i was there's a couple parts where there's this ooze oh yeah it's yeah. like <laughs> real good sounding no you've got really good ears too huh you know what <laughs> and then there's a combination that there is a combination of of like of of um what did you call them keyword pads yeah keyboard pads yeah Yeah, for sure there are okay uh yeah that as well and then that pedal steel player they they also played on torn jacket with silver lining yeah yeah so anytime there's a when anytime there's like slide actually i played some slide but other than that yeah scott did everything else um and he's an incredible guitar player and then on the topic of that song you name drop waffle house (laughs) (laughs) yeah man I really appreciate this. I'm already loving this interview. So. <laughs> you know, I am. I am. I really am. I think my my favorite thing too is that you you slide into it and you bring up the Tucson Waffle House and then it goes into a chorus, right? Yeah. Or or, does, or there's a there's a break. There's some sort of break <laughs> there, but then that picks up. It picks up with more. You know what? What's that? I didn't ever know when I was ever going to put that, that I, like that song was written a long time ago. And I was like, okay. it was when I was doing a, like a more classical project. Okay. I was like, this song's like more of like, I'm like, why don't I just create like movements, but in a ska, like in a rock steady song, and it would just be odd because it'll never come back to the same place. Right. So yeah, yeah. Time, the second verse has some major chords. And anyway, it's just not something done when you're trying to make dance music. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, and then lyrically, um, I actually had to check. I was like, I, I was, I was, you know, this guy was making a journey, right? So he's journey. Yeah. I'm like, you might go to Eureka, um, <laughs> you might go down to San Diego, or he. And then I was like, oh, I gotta throw Waffle House in here somehow. Yeah, but I was like, I did check. I'm like, is there a Tucson Waffle House? And it's like, it's out by the highway. Sweet, yeah. That was one thing yeah. I, I didn't have time to check, but. I was hoping there was actually a piece on Waffle House <laughs> to go with it. And then just the imagery of of stacking sugar packets and and uh and like the pa- the packs of half and half. I mean, yeah. it really paints the picture of sitting in a booth at Waffle House. Oh my god. You know what? But have you seen these okay, we almost. Then I started to, like I don't know why the algorithm it must be this lyric I wrote, but now like uh the Twitter algorithm has decided that I need to see every uh crazy amount of violence that takes place in waffle house <laughs> oh gosh waffle house brawls have you seen these like it's just, yeah you're like, oh yeah <laughs> seen them in real life yeah <laughs> <laughs> i saw a meme yesterday that says uh denny's just is just waffle house for people who can't fight <laughs> <laughs> i thought that was god great bless, god bless oh, america gosh. because yeah, i seriously. like yeah, seriously. God, that's there, there is one Canadian Waffle House. I've been there. Are you serious? Really? Yeah. They don't serve grits, though. No, no, that's very not un-Canadian. Where is it? 
I think it's in Eastern Canada. Huh. Um, but the thing was, is the bass player in our band, who was a total whiny baby at the time, he was complaining that there was no grits, even though I don't even think he really liked grits. And then, <laughs> and then the manager straight up like brought him out a bowl of grits from his own like personal stash. What? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it was also a way nicer Waffle House than any of the ones in the United States. Yeah. That exactly. also makes sense. Yeah. yeah. Wow. That makes sense. All right. Sorry for the waffle. I knew I was going to end up on a Waffle House tangent. No, I like, okay, but this is great because <laughs> you know what? I throw stuff like that in to records. And that's why I said I was loving this interview. No one I thought was ever going to ask me about Waffle House ever. What's your favorite well, thing to get there? Um, you know, and I'm not going to look, I'm going to sound like I don't, I like, I don't have the, um, I, I like how they get, you can get the, like just the American cheese put on top of yeah. like, just slapped on top of the, the hash browns. <laughs> totally insane. I have, I have this. Okay. And we go, we went into a waffle house. That is my image of waffle house. It's just like, it's not even melted. It's just shows up like just yeah. raw. <laughs> and, um, we were in, um, we went, we were on a tour with this band called slightly stupid. You want to tour slightly stupid? That's a crazy bill. Okay, go ahead. I'm sorry. Yeah, well, it, at the time, <laughs> at the time, we thought at the time our age was like, you guys, you know, this is a scene, so you guys could fit in with him. Um. Anyway, we were we did this long tour with those guys. Like we were going through the U.S. and um, and uh, we were in like Tennessee or Kentucky. I can't remember where we were, but um, we were like, we just need to kind of mentally escape from tour life. So we uh, we all just like ate a ton of shrimps out of this bag. <laughs> we started going down the highway, and then every, you know, obviously, we were smart enough that everyone did them, even our sound guy who's driving. So all of a sudden, like I'm like nothing's happening, and then clearly that's when everything starts happening. I, I'm like, whoa, I'm I'm feeling it, and I look over and, at our sound guy, and he's driving like thirty mi- like twenty miles an hour on the highway. So I'm like, <laughs> we need to pull over. So we there's like out of you know, it's like always when you're you know, tripping out of nowhere. There's just this one Hojo that's like on the side of the highway, right where you need it. So we stop yeah. and it was like, we were in a dream. We walked across the, the, um, the highway. This is also a story I've never told before. And we walked across <laughs> the highway and, um, oh, my wife just came home. She's going to be like, what the hell are you doing? Uh, and, um, <laughs> Waffle house story. Waffle house story. I'm telling a waffle house story about shrimp. About shrimps. <laughs> I think he's still, he's still in there. Um, so we walk across, we see this waffle house down this hill. Anyways, we walk and we don't know where we are. And we come in and this girl's like, we asked this girl, we're like, where are we? She's like, um, you're in Shelbyville. And we're like, we're like, Oh, is Springfield like just down the way? And she's like, yeah, Springfield's like 30, 30 Holy miles. Shit. And we're like, what? And she's like, where are y'all from? And we're like, uh, I don't know. We're we're from. She's like, and we're like, have, she's like, I've never been three hours from my home. We we started tripping out like when she found out we we're Canadians that she's gonna kill us or something. And um, and we all ordered that we like our drummer ordered the pecan waffles. This is my right. waffle house story. He ordered the, wa- the pecan waffles. I said, and he said like pecan or something. And um, she's like, where the f- where where are y'all from? Like Canada. And it just it blew her mind. And she told everyone in the waffle house we're from Canada. And um. <laughs> <laughs> and we like we were really it was very uncomfortable we were like it, yeah anyways my story doesn't end well because i can't really remember it <laughs> <laughs> but um that is another waffle house memory i have yeah incredible excellent we were introduced to it on on warp tour that was like in 05 that was like how so many yeah bus stops yeah we'd always stop at the waffle house so they're all exactly the same too they're all like laid out exactly the same. Yeah. Why are the signs so high? <laughs> so why are they so tall? You gotta be able to see it from the freeway. Yeah. Good point. Because because <laughs> because you need it. Because the first, the first thing you, you know what it is because the first thing that someone thinks is nah, and then they're like, well maybe, and if it was like ten <laughs> meters low, or 10 meters, <laughs> it would have been like they'd be like the initial reaction, would be like, no, not tonight, man, I can't do it. <laughs> <laughs> But then when, when you slow that, you know, you'd say, ah, oh, maybe, but you'd be for too far down the highway. So hell yeah. Okay. Back to the music. Yeah. Whose idea was it for the like kind of slap back effect on the drums at the first song? That was you, Jay. Yeah. Yeah. And the demo, the demo even had that. Yeah. Ooh, there's a demo. 
There's the demo. <laughs> when do we get to hear the demos? <laughs> <laughs> so that's another show. We can do another two hours. Of okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. There's always demos. Uh, yeah. I think that was um, that was me. It's so cool because it gives it like a like a shuffle feel almost, but like just from the slapback. Yeah. Um, I was. I I think that originally it was almost like I was like thinking of some sort of like you know eighties you know, maybe like culture club vibe and, oh, um, yeah. and, uh, you know, the beat was very jumpy. And mm-hmm. so, um, yeah, that was the, 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 um, the idea behind it. Nice. So this first song we're talking about, uh, we will meet in a hurricane. We will meet in a hurricane. Yeah. I want to talk a little bit more about the, what the song means to you. Um, I find like, the outro lyrically the outro is like the the kind of the lyrics that stick with me we talk about um uh the if the world has gone to fury you know mm. don't worry because we'll meet in a hurricane yeah and then obviously you named the album we will meet in a hurricane too so it was um a, a an important concept or idea or image or something yeah it is to me actually and, and uh, you know like um well because i think the world has gone to fury right now Mm -hmm. um and uh and i think people are yeah i think it's an easy thing to to succumb to and uh and and believe that your anger is righteous or that you're righteous and no and everyone else isn't um and it's um it's hard to live around people who are like that (laughs) for anyone else um because anger takes up a lot of space uh and um and i don't think it's productive at all um so um that was a, an important line to me as well that in um probably actually the most important line for me in that song now they come to think of it but it is um it was a it is somewhat of a reference to to you know me meeting my wife's staff and um but in a general way i met, I mean, I met her at a time when i was finally ready to make a lot of changes in my life that i hadn't that i maybe wouldn't have been able to do earlier in my life. And, and so as a kind of al- uh, analogy for everyone for like larger than just, just me, I, I think that uh, the idea was that I, you know, I met myself when, when, and like actually confronted myself. <laughs> Sorry. Is that what it means? Is that what you mean by meeting in a hurricane was confronting yourself? Yeah. Def it's. Yeah. 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 So my son came from that hurricane actually. <laughs> I, yes, I do see you. I see you. <laughs> you ask me, what, what am I doing in there? Um, so yeah, he came from that hurricane, actually. Meaning, so you meaning you were able to... Um, I was able to actually have a child in my life. <laughs> yeah, you're able to settle down, be responsible. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, the We Will Meet in a Hurricane um, uh, concept is just that I, I think that, you know, we we... we kind of as people build up a, a like an, ide- an identity for ourselves when we're young and it might serve us for a very long time in life, but eventually it, it fails. And, and, um, and then I think that's maybe the, the part of life when it actually begins is, is you getting honest with yourself. Um, and yeah. uh, you know, for me that, that was, and that, that's when life actually gets interesting, you know, you go, and I, and, and I mean, there's no better place to see that in action than, uh, people in in the music industry because uh, uh there's your the capability for you to create a character and then remain that peter pan for a, an indefinite amount of time and let your ego uh <laughs> run wild, wild is pretty common so oh yeah True. um yeah anyway and that and so that is kind of what it is and and that that's what the line we'll meet in hurricane was and why it sort of represented the uh it was a good representation for the album in general in defense of ska we'll be right back check out the metal pit podcast where we dive headfirst into the world of metal every week 
Whether you enjoy the more laid-back sounds of heavy rock, power metal, doom, or traditional metal, or you prefer the brutal and uncompromising sounds of death metal, black metal, grindcore, or thrash, we are your go-to source for everything metal. So crank the volume and throw those horns high as we delve deep into the albums and bands that shape metal and speak with some of the musicians and bands who keep the spirit of metal alive and well. Look for us on Spotify. Sure, yeah. Walk Through Fire. Um, the song, if I understand correctly, you started writing it in 2009, kind of set it aside, but then uh, Piers, your manager, yeah. kind of found it and was like, this is a good song. What do you think about you know, maybe making this uh, be a full song for the new record? Is that is that accurate? I oh, know, yeah, more, no, more or less, yeah. That's uh, yeah, J- J- you know, it was, uh, we were kind of flirting with the idea way back when, and kind of messing with it in a bunch of sound checks. I think we even tried to record it once in a kind of demo session, and and yeah, uh, going through that old hard drive uh, during the pandemic. Um, yeah, Pierre started and said, "Hey, did you guys ever do anything with this one?" And and we were like, <laughs> "No," and uh, and then yeah, uh, J-, J just kind of reworked it and and. Yeah, it turned out to be one of the strongest uh, singles on the record for a lot of people, which is cool. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And uh, forgot to mention, you guys were uh, embarking on a tour with No Doubt. Let's throw that fact in there. Too. Yeah. That was, <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. What was that like? Touring. Um, it was amazing. You know. Yeah. I we were huge fans of No Doubt, and mm-hmm. um, it was incredible to see. I I mean, you know, it was the first time we saw a band up close that was. Uh, had taken their form to like this next level. Like mm-hmm. once funny yeah. it's just a like bona fide pop star. Like she yeah. projects throughout that that the three of the stadium in a way that was like and at that time too they were still like I, you know, I mean the rest of the band is Tony, all those guys are like are super talented and they also they have a vibe that like there was still like they had their ska SoCal roots that were shining through and like that they you know, we're like into like eighties in the two tone and like the sort of like skinhead style. So they have the, it was really cool to see that elevated cause to that level. Um, and to see the professionalism, like they were working yeah. out every day. Like they were like, I don't know, maybe eating a chicken breast a day. I'm not sure. They were just yeah. really <laughs> like, um, and it was a, it was really inspiring in that way. You know, uh, Paramore was also playing on that tour at the time too. So, yeah. Oh, yeah, no doubt was super welcoming too. Like, I mean, they, yeah, they, they always like, would, you know, say what up to us backstage and kind of come and, you know, you could see them watching the shows. And then uh, every night they'd call, call us all up on stage from both bands um, at the end of their set. So it was kind of, you know, it was nice for them to kind of give everyone a bit of a shout out that way too. So yeah, it was a great tour. Yeah. One time I, I was singing and uh, we, we would do this Adam and the Ant song, uh, yeah. Stand and Deliver. And so I would mm-hmm. do a verse and I didn't know that um, Gwen Stefani was right behind me <laughs> when I was singing. <laughs> and so I was singing um, and, uh, and I finished, I turned around and I just like, <laughs> like elbowed her like pretty hard in the rib. <laughs> and I was like, oh <laughs> shit. It's like, <laughs> like, I was like, I'm gonna get kicked off this door. <laughs> like, and she's like, and then like, because she was going to put her arm around me, and I just, did, I mean, I didn't, wasn't expecting Gwen to find her arm around me. So like, it was. Uh, anyway, that was. <laughs> there's a little funny moment. Oh man, <laughs> how was playing stadiums? That was another thing for me. Like, I hadn't really been to like a big pop concert before. So yeah, like I'd been to a bunch of shows, but nothing like like a big stadium style band or, or artist. So. Like my first experience just being in an arena show was opening it. Um, and it was in Toronto too. We, we started the tour in Toronto where I'm from too. So it was like, yeah, it was just, a, there, there was a lot going on in my head. And I think, you know, over the, the course of the tour, um, it was one of those things where, you know, we knew that a lot of people didn't know who we were and it was an introduction um, for a lot of the, you know, the early audience and stuff, but just getting used to playing and hearing, hearing what you sound like or what the sound, like the reverb of something like, like a room like that sounds like and getting used to that um, I think was super like that, that was, that was a huge learning, um, huge step in learning, which was, which was awesome. Kind of had the chorus, right? Cause I'm kind of curious yeah, what the song meant to you back then and, and how, and maybe if the song means something different as you fleshed it out into, into a full song for 
this record. Because mm-hmm. especially like the line about, um, you know, we could use some rain. Right. But I guess the same will burn it and build it again. You know what? Though, so none of those lyrics, the only thing that I had was fire. So it's just dun, 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 fire, fire. That's all you had? Wow. No, I had the melody line. Like I had all of the verse. I had the verse and the and the chorus melody lines. Um and the and the chord and everything, the chords and everything. So but so my idea of it originally was um, oh, this is sort of like punky, you know, rock steady. I don't know. I didn't think of it. Um I, I, I wasn't sure how we were gonna how it would work. Really, I thought the course was was cool, but um, anyways, um, then uh, when Piers, our manager, was like, "Hey, you should work on this," I was like, I sort of started working it into a more of like a Paul, like thinking more of it in a Paul Simon type way, like mm-hmm. a mother and child reunion kind of sonically. Yeah, so then I started with that's when I started actually writing all those lyrics was like in 2020, 2020 Yeah. Well, yeah. What's the significance of you know we'll build it and burn it again? We could use some rain. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> There's a lot going on in 2020. Um, it just seemed like whatever was, whatever would have helped a situation in terms of people's emotions on, in every way, it would seem like it was just like, let's pour gasoline on that. <laughs> mm-hmm. Sure. <laughs> yeah. You know, I think that it just seemed like, Hey, like uh, the way, the way things were going, it just seemed like everyone was like, let's throw everything away. You know, nothing's good nothing's good and i didn't really you know that's so that was where that line came from it's like well probably the same things will be built again you know um and i don't know i see and i don't and for, if it was my own personal perspective i was like i don't think it's a matter of burning everything that helps yeah for sure so you guys were you guys made this album uh in victoria mostly kind of just the two of you, but I, I assume you kind of worked with other people because this is, this was in 2020, pretty, pretty much like, you know, height of the pandemic stuff. So there wasn't a whole lot of like gathering that could happen. The groove on the song though, on this particular song, I'm curious about how that developed. It's Cause I, I don't imagine it was a band getting together and, and kind of finding that groove. You must've envisioned it and p- pieced it together. Right. Yeah, you're right. We did record the the record in uh, in Victoria, um, just north of Victoria, actually. Um, and yeah, but most of the recording session was, um, well, a lot of it was, yeah, Jay and myself and our producer, uh, Colin Stewart, um, just working together. But we also did, yeah, have some some friends come in, and and our friend Marshall Wildman um, came in, and he actually played drums and did a lot of percussion, and actually did some of the little other elements and other songs as well. So. Um, with a song like that, um, again, it was like, yeah, we did have other versions of it that we had been flirting with over time that had kind of that, like Jay said, Paul simon you know, kind of moving towards a Scottish kind of feel. But um, yeah, it's something that I think kind of worked out a little bit in the studio and and, and then um, kind of got even more fleshed out once, uh, you know, um, Kevin and Amy from The Interrupters were able to to kind of get their hands involved in, in some of the um, the structure as well. So um, but, but yeah, like, uh, I think, I think gen- a lot, a lot of stuff is just kind of felt out the, the way you said it, like the groove kind of the, you know, there's a, there's a starting point for it. And then it just kind of morphs as, as you play and you feel things out and what feels right. I really love the, just the bounce of that song. Yeah. It just, it grooves like it grooves really hard. I feel like, but at the same time, it's like kind of a pop song too. Right. Like it's managed just to like have a real strong bounce, but also just be a, like a straight up pop song. You know, so to go to that, I guess to give you more idea, like I'll, when I'm down, <laughs> we're not doing the demo, the demo uh, um, podcast right now, but the, uh, <laughs> which could be a second edition for this <laughs> excitement's building already. Um, but when I do demo something, so I always like, you know, right at the beat part, like I'll be like, Hey, this is, and one of the things that, I always have, you know, fun, I, fun might be a word, but difficulty is BPM. So I'm like, okay, here's the B. And, and especially with like something like rock steady reggae or ska, you know, the BPM really matters. Like if mm-hmm. you're, it, 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 if you speed it up, it all of a sudden becomes, it just, the feel is so different. So I do spend a lot of time. I think that one was like one seventeen, or maybe, I don't know. I can, it's something around there. And, uh, um 
And uh, so that's usually like, <laughs> that is that that is a process that I do take time with sometimes. <laughs> oh, interesting. Yeah. So we'll have that, we'll have that laid out and mapped out before we go into the studio. Let's see the, uh, the song shine on. Yeah. Shine on. Tell me about, so you, so you got Marcia from, uh, from the skins. The, yeah. I assume you guys have known each other for a while. Yeah. We, they play We, we, they play their first show. I remember the second show. I don't know. Was it the third show? They opened for us in London. Oh, wow. They're an awesome band. And we just, you know, basically once they started, we kind of took a break for like five years and then weren't playing. So, um, we were just happy to, that was actually one of the first songs written. I, I wasn't, it was when we, I wasn't really sure if we, if we were making a Bedouin record. So I had that song and I thought, you know, I was like, oh, I feel like Marcia would sound really good on this. So I sent it to her and she's like, why, is, why don't you just do this? Why don't you make it a Bedouin song? So Ian was like, yeah, I like the song. <laughs> That's how that, so we, so that actually was the first song yeah. for, um, that we, that was put on the record. That is another track that actually I really like, I, go days i'd be like changing the bpm changing the bpm like when does the line sound too fast when does it sound too slow um anyway and then one of the problems and one of the things is it could, is once you put that it's because there's a, uh, like a rock like a ska um skank guitar like that is that i don't know if, if we're going to talk about bpm was like once you put that in it really shifts everything so it was mm-hmm. like it was like a real um I don't know. I'd like change it every other day. <laughs> anyway. The first, the first time I heard that song, like, because it starts with like a pickup note. Yeah. Like it sounds like the beat flips when everything. Yeah. Comes yeah. Yeah, in. yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It doesn't, but it it's like a nice little trick. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I, uh, sometimes it actually messes me up. <laughs> <laughs> I can hear you start it. counting in the wrong spot. And yeah. Oops. Like I'll be like, what the hell is that? Song? And then I'm like, Oh wait, that's our song. <laughs> um yeah no i uh yeah it's it's true because i actually have been I, that happened to me a few times actually when someone was playing it and i was like uh we're we're rehearsing and i was like she's starting in the wrong spot and and all the vocals all the guest vocals female vocals on there are all marcia right we have Catherine. uh Catherine called her from this band the new pornographers she also oh sang, wow yeah she sings on that. Um, Catherine and Catherine was upstairs because Colin, who co-produced the album with me, was was uh, it's his his wife is his Catherine's his wife, um, and so I've played a bunch of shows with Catherine as like just solo, um, and uh, we needed some backups. Catherine's a lot like obviously super talented, um, but she agreed to like come downstairs and get <laughs> some backups <laughs> on that song. So sick. So yeah, um, yeah. Can I say something about, I just remember like the, your comment about shine on the best comment. I, I sometimes do read comments and some guy was like, heard shine on. And he's like, Oh, it's like, it's like Michael McDonald. It's like mo- modern Michael McDonald. <laughs> <laughs> You're like, yes. He was like, kind of, yeah. Kind of. I don't think yeah. this guy like, liked Michael McDonald. <laughs> yeah. But it's one of those internet comments that sticks with you. Right. There was a, when uh, when we weren't recording, Adam had made a comment um, about how the vocals, Marcia's vocals to him sounded like a sample, like just straight up like a sample. Yeah, it sounds like a classic sample from somewhere. It's oh, so sick. That's cool. like, it's really great. Okay, I want to go back to Walk Through Fire because that was one thing I forgot to ask about. The video, you guys are driving. Um, and I was I you guys posted this thing where you said uh during the shoot, you guys encountered a bear. <laughs> Uh, with uh, a mother with her cubs yeah, it was and true. you guys were kind of yeah. scared yeah <laughs> yeah what, what, what happened okay so this is actually like um that video i like you know i made that video and i'm not i have no social media um whiz but um so we were driving and i i looked over we're, still, we're driving out in the kind of valley area outside of vancouver um and it's you know just a lot of farms and but it is but it is in it leads into like you know, the coastal mountains, which then turns into the Rockies. So it's flat, but it's like, you're close to mountains. All of a sudden I see, like, I look over and we're in a, we're in like a 66, like Cadillac convertible. (laughs) So all of a sudden I look over into the field beside us and there's just this massive black bear 
she's just booking it through the field. Like she's having a great time. Like it looked like she was having a blast. Like she's jumping up in the air. And, and like, um, I was like, Jesus Christ. And I'm like, thank God we're like, you know, she's about like, you know, 300, 400 meters in, into that field. And anyways, we turn up a, like a country like road and we're going and all of a sudden the thing just, goes right in front of like she just runs right in front of the car and i'm like oh yeah. my god and slam on the brake and she goes down into the ditch below into like a field and then all of a sudden like her cub comes out and i'm like this is a this is like the nightmare right like this isn't what they yeah. tell you don't get between a mama and her cub and this cub sees us and we're in a convertible and i'm like so i start being like no 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 and it thinks that we're like friends it starts running towards <laughs> us and I was like, this is, we're really, we're F now, <laughs> right? Like, because we're in a convertible, like that bear is going to come from behind and just, she can just sit right in the car and just maul us. Yeah. So I go, no, no, no. And I reverse this, like all this Cadillac anyways, and the bear like runs back, but it runs the opposite way. So we're still between the bear and the, somewhere the mama bear is, right? Looking for a cub. And then we just gas, and then I just gassed it, and then um, <laughs> and we never got attacked. But um, it was a pretty, it was a bit, it was the best moment I've ever had on a tour, on a on a music video show. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so you guys played uh, Victoria Ska and Reggae Festival last year, yeah. And uh, so I watched this video of you playing uh, "When the Night Feels My Song," which is a uh, your song, your, your big hit from t- two thousand five. Yeah, and. As you're playing the song, like you're you're getting the sun setting during the song. <laughs> Did you do that on purpose so that you could get the sunset while you're singing "Say Goodbye to the Setting Sun"? <laughs> yeah, it's in our good. contract. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We are like, you should come to this show, guaranteed sunset yeah. every night. <laughs> yeah. yeah. That's what we were trying to do with that video. I want to get a sense of how big this song is, because I think it wasn't particularly big in the U.S., no. right? Okay. Canada, the song, how big was the song in Canada? Or is? It still is. Was, it still is. is like everyone, well, definitely everyone of a certain, if you're in listening to the radio in 2005, everyone knows that yeah. song in Canada. Like you can, they don't know the band. Like, you know, like I'm going to say they don't know the band. Like, Right. There's a lot of people who know the music and mm-hmm. don't know that. Like I can be in Home Depot and hear like a lot of our songs play in Canada. Yes. Um and uh to me that's always a sign of success because no <laughs> like no <laughs> what, did, who, what what how do they choose that music for Home Depot? Um but we were the most played song like in that summer we were played I I think we were the third most played song. Like, and it was the other one was Green Bay, Green Day and Nickelback. Yeah, so they had that Nickelback had that huge song, and so it was huge in Canada and also in um in England as well, in the UK. I tried it on the BBC. Yeah, yeah. I was going to ask because I was talking to my friend Dan Pothas from the band Emmy Three Thirty. Okay, and I was like, are you, are you? I was asking him if he knew of you guys. He's like, oh yeah, yeah. I remember when I toured the UK with Random Hand, they played just played you guys nonstop and then when we went to and then australia i was touring and i heard you i heard them all the time yeah but i've never That's heard good. them in the u.s yeah no no it's the u.s right <laughs> simon dummy if you're listening <laughs> <laughs> we did well everywhere else hey i don't know things just yeah that's the way it was so yeah i also read too that you uh the song actually got picked up in the uk first before canada yeah Interesting. Yeah. Do you know how it got picked up in, in the UK? Does just some DJ just take an interest in it? Well, it was there's a there was this guy, Mike Davies, who's from California, who had a show called The Lockup, their punk rock show in on on BBC Radio One. And he would play mainly like, you know, American punk, you know, um, like bad religion or whatever. So um he heard our track. Uh, cause we were on a label, a uh, punk label in Canada and he heard it and he just played it a few times. Um, and, uh, someone told me that they're like, Hey man, this guy's like, and I didn't really understand that, that how big a deal that was to be played on radio one. But, um, someone said to me, Hey man, there's this guy that's playing your, your music, um, 
on BBC. And uh, I went over to visit some friends in London. And I just said, I'm going to email this guy and be like, hey, I'll come in and play it for you in the studio. <laughs> so I did. And I also I also had met earlier um, uh, this guy, Scott Shields, who I yeah, um, mentioned earlier. But um, and he played in the Mescaleros with Joe Strummer. And I knew he was in London. So I said, hey, do you want to come and do this BBC thing? Like knowing like if it was a BBC thing, he'd say yes, because it may maybe seem like I'm bigger than I am. So he came into the studio with me um, and we played the song and Mike was like, oh, he's, he was such a nice guy. And they just happened to that next week have this meeting at, at Radio One and Joe Wiley, who runs the daytime show, um, they're like, hey, we, we know we're looking for something just different, you know, not from a major label. Does it, what interesting tracks are you guys playing right now? And they just, they said, Hey, we just played this. These guys just came, this guy just came in, um, this band Bedouin sound clash and they just added it <laughs> to, to, to like, <laughs> they just a-listed it. And I mean, they, they getting a-lists on radio one is like, that's like every major label is gunning for that. Yeah. And it's cutthroat in, in the, in the UK. So, and that happened when we were on warp tour in 05. So we didn't really understand. And then we went over, we like last minute, they're like, you guys are blowing up and, we went over there. To, we got put on uh, Leeds and Reading last minute. We were playing at like noon. Um, and there were like 2,000 kids there and they knew all the songs. And we were like, it was, that was the first moment where I was like, something's happening that isn't related to us schlepping records out of the back of a minivan, you know? So, right. Um, but it's all, it's, it's that there was that, there's the, there's the putting yourself out there and then there's the, just weird magic that happens that's like luck sure you know? yeah so. yeah you can never orchestrate that no yeah no you can't yeah yeah and so did did the song catch on in canada because of the uk or is it completely unrelated it was kind of already catching on and then yeah you know we had we had the edge had picked it up which is our big like rock station in toronto um and then um we had also licensed it to a um, like a department to, to a department store. Uh, they were like, <laughs> "This is right," <laughs> um, and kind of like Target, you know. And so it was this weird confluence of things where, like, it was blowing up in the UK. Canadians are like, when whenever something does well outside of Canada, they're like, "Okay, I guess we can like this." So there was that element <laughs> happening that they should be like that. We sh they should be supporting it, and then. And then on top of that, you had these like all these like soccer moms who were hearing it on this department store ad. And I say that because like all the, all of a sudden all these moms started being like emailing us. And this is on like on MySpace at the time being like, hey, my kids love your music. <laughs> 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 so it was just weird. This is what I mean by when I say like the song had this ubiquity, like it, it took off in this way where if you ask certain people, it's be kind of kind of become in Canada like this campfire jam of like where it was like a huge section of people that got into that song. Um, you know, that probably have no idea what ska music is. Don't know what anything that we're talking about, you know? <laughs> yeah. Like now, now did it become, I also read it became a theme to something called CB, uh, CBC kids. Yeah, it did. Yeah. Yeah. That was later on. Well, okay. What is CBC kids? This is like CBC is <laughs> like our, it would be like, well, CBC in Canada. So it's like our BBC. Um, Oh. It's like your NPR. Well, you PBS. It'd be like your PB. Like, so the thing is, it like it is like NPR and it is like PBS. So CBC is the Canadian Broadcasting Company. So it has both television, radio, does your film and stuff. Um, but it's like their kids programming. So on their in between segments, our song would play for all these kids. So <laughs> yeah. then, not only did you have like the 05, 06 people, like you know that was, big, but then from like 07 to like two thousand. 11 or 12 every kid was hearing it every day <laughs> so, so you have like younger kids who are like they don't they're like i'll be like uh um they, they're coming out like this happened on our last tour like kids would come out to our show and then we'd play that at the end they're like that's you i didn't know that was you like they know <laughs> they know the song they didn't realize that we know so that's what i mean by it by the song has a way bigger life than than us Yes. That's the trip. Yeah. Okay. So you guys actually meet in 2000 at the university in Toronto mm -hmm. in Ontario. 
you guys are both going to college and as I understand it, your moms met first and then suggested you guys become friends. I think so. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, they did that's, actually. Yeah. That's the legend. Yeah. yeah. You guys bonded over music. So the music that you guys were both into revolved around like Jamaican music and kind of like early eighties UK post punk type stuff, right? Yeah. And also like for like massive attack and and like later stuff too. Like we like Finley Quay and Tricky and yeah, Asian Dub Foundation. Mm-hmm. In terms of Jamaican music, were you into any particular type stuff? Um, well, yeah, I mean, for me, you know, like I, I, I was into, I guess, a lot of earlier stuff. Well, no, I, it kind of covers the, the range, I guess. I, I kind of grew up with a lot. Of, well, I, I spent time around a lot of uh, Jamaican and Caribbean music because my parents are from Guyana. So um, it's just part of the culture. And so I, mm-hmm. I grew up with, you know, I, my dad also co- collected records and used to kind of DJ a little bit for the family and stuff. So he's got a pretty good record collection. So I grew up around a lot of the, you know, kind of original, especially like rock steady and reggae and ska, you know, some ska as well. But um, because, you know, the culture is, so, you know, because I grew up in that culture, they would, they would always follow what, whatever was current as well. So, you know, being born in the eighties, you know, a lot of the stuff that I got close to was, you know, stuff like, um, you know, I, I guess like, you know, King Jammies and like that new modern dance hall kind of sound at the time with like the Yellow Mans and the, you know, um, Lieutenant Stitchy type artists and things like that. So um, that was the kind of, that was the kind of Jamaican stuff that I was listening to. And then, I mean, by the time I met Jay, you know, I'd, I'd gotten into DJing myself as well. And I was mostly buying a lot of like um, dance hall reggae and, and, and kind of lovers rock reggae. Um, so I was into a lot of that kind of Jamaican music at the time when we met. Mm. And I was more like, I was far more of like a dub music. Uh, like that's why I love massive attack. Uh, but in, in any of the artists that I was introduced to would be more on like the, um, I guess what do they call the golden era, like seventies, like I like burning spear toots and the Maytals, obviously the whalers. I was into, I, you know, I loved, obviously loved the specials and the clash. So I knew Devin, I had like a Desmond Decker record and, um, but I, I wasn't aware there were a lot of gaps that I had in, in my musical knowledge and didn't realize, like, I think it's, you know, talking to Eon and then understanding like, oh, he like, Eon would tell me this is how, like what a sound clash is, you know, where two sound systems come together and they, they clash with records and they have dub plates and, and then all of a sudden I, I realized that so much of the music I listened to had been so heavily influenced by, by dub music or by, by that culture, you know? So um, whether it was Massive Attack or it was The Clash, like, you know, two bands that I thought were really different actually had very similar uh, influences. The Jamaican music, the, uh, the tendrils that it has reached to are, are just mind blowing. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, it is. And um, so it was that learning, you know, I think it's that, that process of learning something with, with somebody else. It's just, you're like, Oh, like this and this, you you know, that was the excitement of like, well, why don't we try to create our own language in with that excitement, you know? So. Yeah. That's one of the things I really like about Bedouin is um, you're taking a lot of these influences. You're taking ska, reggae and punk elements, but, the way you put it together is very unique. Thank you. Thank you. You know, yeah. a lot of a lot of bands are taking the same elements, but they're they're going a different direction. Yeah, you know, the, I think the hard thing is is if I like look at it like not just with my own band, but like you know, when you put when you have the words reggae or ska, and you throw that as, as a label on any band that's not tra- like traditional. Mm-hmm. Um, it has a, it has a real like it's a really strong like word that has an effect on what you think the, the band's gonna sound like or what it's like you know and I um, and so, you know we're not a reggae we like, we probably right. I don't think have we ever played, I mean we obviously have songs that are maybe somewhat traditional I don't think so though do we? Yeah I mean we have a there's a couple songs like you know that are but that are, we're not like a reggae band yeah no we're not a reggae band that's for sure and we've never tried to be in. You know, that's the funny thing because you got, because of, because of a certain feel that kind of permeates a lot of the music, especially at certain times in our career, 
people, you know, that's what they gravitate towards is that it's that's a reggae band because of that, you know, having that upstroke or or just having that that dan- that that kind of danceable feeling. But I think we, Jay and I have always approached it as just we have, we've never really, and I don't know if lots of artists say it, but we've just honestly never tried to define it. We we always take elements of things that we we kind of know and things that we'd like at the time and just bring them together, you know. So yeah, it's always been an interesting thing to hear. You know, I, I get I get why people might think we're a reggae band, but we're pretty we're pretty uh, we're pretty we're pretty sure we're not. <laughs> <laughs> so your first record, Root Fire. Second record, Sounding a Mosaic, is um the that's the song that's the record that um When the Night Feels My Song, yeah. The record that has that song on it. Um but at the time you guys weren't like particularly big and you were yeah. on Stomp Records, I think, right? And uh, yes. did you but how did you end up getting Daryl Jennifer from Bad Brains to produce that record? Um our manager at the time, Paj Williams, was a uh was a good friend of Daryl's. Um and he had tour managed them and he introduced them to, he introduced Daryl to the music. He said, Hey, like they've got this band. He called me one day. He was like, Hey, do you know who bad brains are? I'm like, yes, I know who bad brains are. <laughs> it's like Daryl, Daryl wants to produce your record. And we, I was like, wow. but you know, a patch, I was like, okay, this is either like going to happen or it's not going to happen. <laughs> right. <laughs> anyway. Um, <laughs> But we went to Montreal and like we met Daryl for the first time and he was like he became like our uncle. He's just yeah, literally one of the sweetest guys. Also, you know, can be terrifying, but um <laughs> you know, he's like he it was a it, he he had a, he's had the most I think I don't know, because we were so young and he yeah. made us play. Like he he was really hard on us. Like he he was really hard on our play our musicianship and being like, you guys can't play. <laughs> <laughs> he's, like, he's like, he, you know, and he, he'd always have good stories. Like, I mean, obviously he has amazing stories. He's in bad brains, like right. probably better stories than I think anyone, even the Rolling Stones have, you know, like, I mean, in terms of like the weirdest thing you could imagine happening, whether it's opening for a dancing pig or HR taking like budgies on a, on a yeah. plane and like, you know, just random crazy stuff that only happens to bad brains. Um, but he also would be like, you know, when we were young, we wrote parts that we couldn't, we couldn't play. And, right. and then he would look at us and be like, cause that's what you guys have just done. <laughs> 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 so why don't you sit there and learn how to play it? And then we'd have to sit there. So it was like, I don't know, listening to a guy like that, there's a, there's like a knowledge that guys like him have that I don't know. You know, even the way he talk about like kick drums, he's like, I can tell how old a guy is by listening to his kick, just the kick drum, the way he plays his kick drum. <laughs> and I can, and I still think about that now. Like when I listen to someone play drums, I listen to their kick drum. It's something I wouldn't have known if I hadn't had someone old, like older who was like more of a jazz guy tell you that. That's a, that's what he listens for. Um, anyway, I don't know. It's a random story, but oh, no, it's interesting. You were, earlier you were talking about being on Warp Tour in 2005, and this is kind of like, I, but when you started the tour, this is before the song took off and it was taking yeah. off. Um, I read a, I read a random comment on Facebook that I want to I want you guys to tell me a little bit more about. You said that in uh, 2005 Warp Tour, when you played in Tempe, Arizona, it was the hottest show <laughs> you've ever played in your life. Yeah, yep. Tell us about it. <laughs> you thought, well, it's near the Waffle House. Uh, <laughs> they didn't even need to use. We the, were crawling grid, to get to the waffle house. They didn't even need, need to use the griddle that day. They just went use the cement. <laughs> yeah. um, they just put all the oil and the cement outside. Um, <laughs> it could. It was 115. Oof. Yeah, something like oh. that. It was. It was. It was crazy. It, the, the thing that I remember most about it too, other than it just just being sweltering, was <laughs> it was one of those days where. So on work tour, you get, you know, you wake up and you go and you look at your schedule, unless you're, you know, on one of the main stages, even then you kind of have to look at the schedule and see what time you're on. But for us, it kind of depended, you know, you had to find where your stage was. So we got up, looked, okay, we're on this stage. So we went and we had to drag all the gear in the heat across like this, like racetrack kind of horse track thing. 
And then at the last minute, they switched our stage. <laughs> mm -hmm. So then we, we had to drag all the stuff again across the field to another stage. So I just, re I remember the comment, like, I just remember waking up feeling like it was crazy hot and then just, just dying before we had to play because we had to drag the gear like <laughs> twice in, in, in one sitting. Eon, at that, at that point, are you playing through a 810 Ampeg cab? At that point, I was playing, you know, so yes, and but it wasn't mine. It wasn't mine. It was, it was, uh, it was a tour. So yeah, at that time, I was touring with like this little, um, uh, we have a company up here in Canada called Yorkville. So I had this little like Yorkville kind of combo rehearsal amp that was like our touring app at the time. So an 810 was kind of like, yeah, it was like my first time really getting to, to use something serious. But I did have to help carry that stuff sometimes. So yes, I was dragging things like that, and especially the drum gear. Um, yeah, dragging that stuff and, and our merch tent and stuff like that. I just remember the three of us just like stumbling. It just felt like we were stumbling across this field. Uh, Do you remember what the audience did at that that day? <laughs> I mean, were they able to dance or they were dead tired? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, they were, dead. and and also this warp tour. So like, it wasn't like there was. There wasn't like, it wasn't like the thought wasn't like, how are you going to hydrate all these kids? It was more like, get that fire hose and we'll just spray them. Like, I remember they, we just, they were just constantly oh, being sprayed. But there was also like a bit of like, to be honest, towards the end where I was like, you know what? I've had to watch like these guys, this event, like Avenge Sevenfold is playing. And if you want, to die of heat exhaustion is listening to Avenge Sevenfold right now, <laughs> then go for it. Like it was, I couldn't believe some of the people like you'd see these guys. <laughs> and I'm like, you're going to die for Fall Out Boy today. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like you're going to die for My Chemical Romance. Right. That's how you're going out. <laughs> 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 yeah yeah that's right so two, War warp tour 2005 was the most attended warp tour ever yeah. because of uh fallout boy and my, my chemical, chemical romance yeah. where they were just blowing up at that point yeah. yeah yeah and uh there was a lot of bands on there like we would always play next to uh under oath they were massive they were mm -hmm. they would draw huge numbers yeah um so you're yeah. on the same that was same warp tour as uh was were the matches on that tour yeah, the matches. Yeah. the matches were on that tour. Uh, the plain white tees were on that Union, tour. Yeah, plain white tees. Uh, yeah, they they. There's another band. That's strike anywhere. Yeah, strike. Well, the, yeah. Okay, we could list now. Like, yeah, strike anywhere. The explosion. <laughs> um, we were friends with all the band. We were friends with all the bands that like. Uh, no, none of the kids showed up for. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> like who? So like it'd be us. The explosion. Strike anywhere. Um, like. The joke was that all the other bands would come watch us play, but uh. no one would come watch us play. <laughs> <laughs> we did get to play against. We did like we did we did share kind of like the what was a Hurley and Volcom stage set up with uh, with bands like the Agrolites though, which was really cool. That's why I got no, to that was later. Like that. that was two thousand seven. Oh, well, I guess you're right. How yeah. many times did you guys do the Warp Tour? Twice. Twice. <laughs> We love like Lyman was has been was so great to us. Kevin Lyman who runs it, and he would just be like, "Hey, whenever you guys want to come on, just let me know." And I think it's because he knew that it was like for us, it was like being sent to slaughter. Like we were just <laughs> we <laughs> we were like this this like anomaly on the tour, and like I I don't know like we I don't know we play in like Middle America and. I remember under oath, like they'd be like, "This one's for Jesus," and like everyone would be going crazy, and like then I'd be like, <laughs> and I'd be like, <laughs> I'd look, I'd look at us, I'd be like, I really just hope that, you know, they're gonna stay for us, and then it was like Jesus part of the crowd, and like, <laughs> they all like mass exodus to, uh, to another place. Anyway, that was the story of our band. So I any, uh, on the war tour, but we had a, it was great though. I like like saying that I loved it. It was great. Did we? Did you do the uh, what is it called? The barbecue band thing? We did that. No, we weren't the barbecue band, but we did do it once. Like, uh, or did we? We didn't do it actually. We played. No, we never did the barbecue thing. We never, yeah, they used to do some like kind of like side shows every now and then when there was a big gap or, or like enough time. And yeah, we played on a couple of those, which were really fun. But no, we did, we never were the barbecue band. Our friends left alone with the barbecue band the first time around. I, I think. Yeah. 
and they'll be playing with the interrupters in LA. So you, you were talking about the Leeds Festival already. I think that was in 2006, right? That's correct. Yes. This is the first time playing in UK after the, the song had broken. Yeah. So I read that, I don't know if this is the same thing. I read that um, you lost your voice. Yeah. And that when it came time to sing uh, When the Night Fills My Song, that um, the entire crowd just like took over for you and sang the, the song. And it was okay that you didn't, you weren't able to sing because the whole crowd was. It was really, really amazing. Like I was, um, we played Reading. So this must have been 2006, right? Because we were, because we, okay, yeah. Yeah. Because okay. I was like, we, so yeah, played Reading. And then we got to Leeds. I just, oh, it's such a, it's such a terrible feeling because you just see all these kids and you're like, oh, I just want to kill this show. And um, I couldn't make a sound. So we played and I, I could sort of sing at the beginning. And then finally I just said, like, I couldn't, I think Jan, you had to say like, you can't sing. Yeah. And instead of them, and we're like, we had to walk off stage, but they just started like the English are an amazing audiences to play for when they are like, you know, in terms of their, they're so vocal and they, they are like, they just, they want to sing. Yeah. So they just started singing. They just started singing the next song they wanted to hear. (laughs) (laughs) And they did. And then we just started playing with them. Like, we was like, fine, we'll start playing. They sang like, we sang like, I think four songs, four or five songs, like with just, um, with just the audience singing. Yeah, and 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 they kept singing like when with one tonight they just they just yeah. kept singing the hook over and over after like we kind of were just standing there not even playing anymore and they were just singing it and yeah we walked off stage and they were still singing it and I and and the guy yeah I remember one of the guys who worked there came out he's like you know he's like I've never I've never seen that before and it was like he was just shocked he's like thought we were gonna get <laughs> like that what is not gonna go well and it was one of the most memorable shows. Yeah, it was amazing. And actually, after that, we we were starting. We were touring way too much, and um, because we were trying to keep up with the song, and uh, we were, you know, deadheading stuff in in the U.S. where it was like a really hard, still really hard go. And we were on to we like we were supposed to start a tour with Flogging Molly that was going to be like two and a half months long, and we had to take some time. I had to I had to go back home, and I had bronchitis. I didn't realize at the time, but I got it. Uh, probably, I don't know. Just sat there in the unsanitary conditions of Reading. <laughs> in a water, sure. from the water closet <laughs> yeah. uh, at Reading. And uh, anyway, so yeah, so we, we had to miss, that was right after we were going to go out with Flogging Molly. Anyways, so that's what mm-hmm. I remember at least. Yep. So you guys have a, a more hit singles in Canada, right? Yeah. Yep. Was When the Night Feels My Song always the biggest? Yes. No, that's the biggest one. Yeah, walls fall down. Yes, is like mm-hmm. coming in the next. Like, you know, I think you call St. Andrews. Yep, St. Andrews did well on radio as well too. For, um, yeah, that was when people still watch videos too. So like, uh, and like, and our you know MTV much for us it was much music, but we got a lot of play for those those yes. songs, which mattered at that time. So. This whole time, though, you're never able to really break into the U.S., even though you're touring down there. And yeah, we we probably could have spent more time doing it. I don't know. We didn't spend. We it's tough because you you'd be like, oh, we're gonna <laughs> you play like you play really big venues in Canada, and then you go and you just go to the U.S. to lose money. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> so you headline a show in Canada. How many people do you think it would there would be there? uh at that time yeah like yeah so 2000 usually a night like yeah yeah that's good that's good it's yeah. good for, and then for, and then we hit the states and you know 50 might show right. up and, <laughs> and uh <laughs> and you know the other here's the other thing too that when we looked at it, it like the, the, so for example england had a real like because of the history that they have obviously with jamaica um being part of the commonwealth like there's and the wind, you know, the immigration and and also just they even since the sixties, like that music is like Motown on the like, you know, like they there's a real knowledge of reggae and ska music beyond it just being about smoking weed or, you know, in the States it was really like it's like SoCal and Sublime 
Um, and there wasn't really much other avenue. There isn't, there wasn't really much, there wasn't much else for it. Like there wasn't another avenue really we felt at that time. Right. And so it was harder when, when you'd say reggae to people in the States, it, it had a really different meaning than it did to people in the UK. And I think for a band for like that, ours, yeah. which is sort of hard to understand in the first place, we always felt like we know, like, you know, kind of like going back to that Waffle House when the girl would ask us, like, what's your band mm-hmm. called? And we'd go, Bedouin Soundclash. <laughs> <laughs> and she looked at us like we were, you know, like, I don't know, like terrorists <laughs> or something. So, like, it, we just sort of felt like maybe we're just not, like, you know, the U.S. just won't ever get, maybe won't, not that they won't get it, but, like, we just, we're, we're not, where there's too many complications. <laughs> yeah. I, I'm, I'm, I'm really stoked you guys are getting some dates with the interrupters. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's awesome. Um, I feel like their, their, their crowd will appreciate you. Oh yeah, yeah. Yeah. And we've done shows with them in the past and it's, it's awesome. Like they're great. Yeah. I was just looking on tw- Twitter though. What happened to the St. Louis date? Ah, oh no. You know, it's funny. That's, that's, yeah. It's the second person actually that's, uh, that's kind of mentioned. Uh, yeah. It's just, 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 just logistics and stuff. Uh, gotcha. Yeah, unfortunately, but you know, I'm sure it'll be a good show. Yeah, we couldn't make it. <laughs> the yeah. drive is too. The drive is <laughs> word. <laughs> just kidding. The drive's crazy. It was that. It, it, like we the it like it was just physically impossible for us to actually get to the show. And when gotcha. you pointed that out to um, the promoter, they're like, "Okay, <laughs> yeah." <laughs> it's like it's not our tour, so like. But it's going to be physically impossible for us to make it because we love St. Louis. Yes, love them. I want to ask if, if you don't mind talking about it, because um, I've heard you talk about it elsewhere. But um, sure. So you re- the band is kind of on hiatus for like almost a decade, and you come back with Mass in 2019. Mm-hmm. But um, one of the f- components of this is that there was um, like drug and alcohol issues, and then you getting sober. Yeah. And I think by the time you did mass, you were like sober, right? Yeah. Part, yeah. And so some of like um, coming back, as I understood it, was had a lot to do with having kind of gone through the personal journey of everything so sobriety entails, which is not just stopping drugs. It's like having a complete like, you know, meeting in a hurricane, yeah. like you said earlier, like, like, ha- uh, like complete self-examination. Change. Yeah. So I, I'm just curious about that. So um, what, at what, what kind of led you to actually re-pursue the band and do another album? Did you feel like you'd reached a point of where you were comfortable with yourself enough to do that? Yeah, I think so. I, I th- there was a piece of me that was always like, "Hey, if I wasn't if I wasn't ha- hammered all the time, if I wasn't messed up, what would that band? What would it look like? You know, would I have?" these feelings because a lot of the time towards the end of um 2010 2011 i was like kind of done you know i was i but when you're also struggling with addiction and and uh well when you're struggling with addiction which is you know a manifestation of other things uh it's really hard to know what what you don't like and what you do like and it's really hard to get out of situations because that would require an agency and clarity that I don't, I didn't have, you know? Um, and as a result, you're also mess. You're just sort of the center of problems all the time. And so all you want to do is like make, you know, well, just like me again, you know, can you like, <laughs> and then that next, then maybe the night after you, you do it again, all over again, everyone's like, come on, you know, like how many times can we go through this? With you? So um, there's that dance, which sort of gets in the way of actually figuring out your life my life. So when we took a hiatus, you know, I was like, you know, I'm going to do a entirely different project. Um, and, um, I got sober and in 2014 and we started, I started working towards mass. I was like, you know what? I just want to try to give this a shot. And we did. And we got, you know, I was like worked out of my house and we, we finally got down to new Orleans with like Prez hall. And it was when we were down in new Orleans, I was, like two weeks shy of being like being two years sober and just i wasn't actually sober though you know i was like i was um i wasn't drinking but i wasn't sober i was still you know like doing the same things with my ego worrying about the same things um 
and like still living a lot of fear. And so I remember like one day, it's just like, I'm going to start drinking again. And I did. And it was like, and that, so that deli- so we, we, re- that's why that album is so kind of j- disjointed because in terms of its timing, we finished that album in 2016, but it didn't come out till 2018 or 2019 more or less because then I, you know, went back into it and, and I knew that I had to, for me, I was like, I need to get so bored and everything needs to go away. And I finally got to this place where there's like no emails, no phone calls. I was like, okay, I'm done playing music. I'm done. You know, and I was reconciled to that. Um, and I, I think that's the moment, you know, I think you hear a lot of people when they have a psychic change, it's like when you finally surrender and say, Hey, like I'm done. Um, I'm not trying to like work. I'm not going to try to like work through it, like work around it, not work through it, but like, maneuver manipulate or i'm just done you know i need a better life and i want to you know this isn't it um and that happened thankfully that happened for me and going actually going back to home depot i remember i was sitting there be like i could stay in this place where i was and i'll be like i'll just go work at home depot um (laughs) and it was a great job i was like why not i think that and that thought why it sticks out to me is that i was that was when i thought hey you know you're enough without without needing to be all these other things that I'd always thought I needed to be from when I was young. Like you're enough without them. And also you still are that even without all the the things you, you know, try to be. So that's why it was an important moment for me. And I think that um, once that kind of took place, there was just later on, I was like, well, we should still put this album out. Okay. Let's put the album out. Well, let's try to do a few shows. And we kept doing it and we, it's just been sort of incremental. It's like, well, um, you know, let's try one more thing. And that kind of got us to we'll meet in a hurricane. And in my opinion, it's the album that, uh, you know, I made being four years sober and five years sober. And like, that is the most like our early stuff in spirit. And, um, I'm really proud of it in that way. I read, um, I think it was an interview you did, but you said, and I think this relates to sobriety, but you said music, was the place in my life where you can, where I could meditate or find peace. Yeah. Uh, and then, but eventually I can't remember the rest, but something about, you know, eventually it becomes this sort of negativity. Yeah. You know, this, but I was thinking um, the part about it that really kind of caught my attention was to me, we will meet in a hurricane sounds like meditation and peace. Oh, wow. That's great. <laughs> so it kind of, so, you know, you, if you had like, like you said, that's the album you made it four years sober. It sounds like there's peace in that record, even though there's still, ne- there's still things, there's acceptance and there's struggle and there's things at the core of it as well. Yeah. You know what I think too? Well, I pre- like, first of all, that's great to hear. I think that's the key. <laughs> that's the, as I, I don't know if it's getting older, but it's realizing that peace, feeling peace is like the thing. And I used to be like, that sounds boring. <laughs> you know like you want and you want oh no it's supposed to feel like a lightning bolt like life's supposed to feel like you know turn it to 11 um but it's having peace and then in, and then also slowly stuff you you can create a lot more interesting things because it's no longer about you like so no like you know when it, when I when you're when I'm was really into addiction I mean everything's about me it's about making myself feel better because I'm in a pain body. I'm, you know, and nothing else exists around except in this very small world. And I think that idea of peace, when you become more peaceful, then all of a sudden you can look out and see things beyond you and uh, create something that's actually, you know, probably more interesting and more available to other people to step inside too. <laughs> Don't go anywhere. If you want to hear the rest of this conversation, head over to our Patreon. Thank you for listening to In Defense of Scott. Please rate and review this podcast and tell a friend. Follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok at In Defense of Scott. Pick up Aaron's book, In Defense of Scott, at your local bookstore or online. This podcast is edited by Chris Reeves of Scott Punk International. This is your co-host, Adam Davis of Omnigong. 
leaving you by saying ska now more than ever. We talked for a while with these guys, and then behind the curtain, we talked a whole lot more. Yeah. I mean, this these are could possibly like... be the, the longest, the longest behind the curtain we've yeah, ever I mean, recorded. We usually do 10 to 15 minutes extra, but this was yeah. got, had to be 40 minutes, maybe? At least. <laughs> At least. I mean, if you really break it down by, um, you know, if you spend $5 on the Patreon, like the amount of minutes you're getting per dollar just for this one alone, well worth it. So we're going to need you to head over there. Yeah. Sign up for the Patreon. Mm -hmm. If you're already signed up for it and you have a friend who's a Bedouin Sound Clash fan, tell them, hey, you want to hear this conversation? The whole thing. Mm-hmm. Head on over, and if you sign up for the Patreon, you won't have to hear these bits. It'll just go straight from in front of the curtain to behind the curtain. Yeah, it's it's like magic. And if you have a friend who is uh, not a fan of Bedouin Soundclash, they're new to the band, just have them sign up for the Patreon as well, <laughs> <laughs> and maybe hip them to the band. Yeah, why not? Yeah. All right, next week. Friend of the show, friend of us in real life, Esteban Flores. Ska's official keyboard player. (laughs) East LA Ska legend.